on our agenda seven, the ordinances. And um, as I mentioned, the next six items on the agenda are ordinance 5086, excuse me, 5084, 85, 86, 87, 88, and 89. And they all relate to one development project, but are separate land use decisions. If no one objects, I would like to suggest that uh, we receive the staff report from a uh, with the planning uh, commission's recommendation and have the staff present all six items in one report. Is that okay with everyone? Okay. Uh, with that being said, then we will have uh, Heather and Chuck come up and, uh, or Chuck come up and run us through this. Uh, uh, I'm sure it's going to be a great presentation, Chuck. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councilors. So this is uh, the consideration of the six ordinances that were referenced for uh, what's being referred to as the Baker Creek North project. <clears throat> this is the location of the site. It's uh, on the northwest area of the city uh, near the city limits, uh, north of Baker Creek Road and east of uh, Hill Road as it, if it were to extend north. Uh, there's three areas identified there, which I'll touch on in more detail because the different components of the applications apply to different portions of the site. Um, but the first application is a comprehensive plan map amendment on the southwestern portion of the site. Uh, the comp plan map amendment would result in an existing 11.3 acre commercial designation going down to 6.62 acres and the remainder area being uh, designated as residential. Uh, following that is a zone change application uh, from the current mix of R1 single family residential and EF80, which is remnant county zoning, uh, to a mix of C3 and a majority of R4 multiple family residential. Uh, following that is a plan development amendment to uh, reduce the size of an existing plan development overlay district that applies to the portion of the site uh, that would be designated as commercial on the comprehensive plan map and zone C3 uh, should the first two requests be approved. Uh, the applicant's also requesting that the existing conditions of approval be amended to allow up to 120 multiple family dwelling units and uh, require a minimum uh, acreage of neighborhood commercial uses on the site. Uh, the next application is a plan development request for the uh, larger area that's proposed to be zoned R4 uh, to allow for the development of 280 single family detached dwelling units um, and all the right of way improvements and some open space improvements associated with that. Uh, the plan development does include some requested modifications for lot size, setbacks, uh, dimensions, driveway widths, uh, alley widths, and uh, block lengths and street trees. Uh, following on that plan development request is a tentative subdivision application that is consistent with that plan development and allows for that 280 um, single family dwelling units to be platted uh, in a 10 phase subdivision. And then finally a landscape plan for the proposed open space tracks, uh, the street trees and um, yeah, those, mainly those two components for the uh, subdivision area for the single family residential portion of the property. Uh, the applications were all submitted for concurrent review, which is why they're all coming before you tonight uh, under one review process. Um, typically subdivisions and landscape plans don't come before you, so that's something new, but that is the reason that they're all coming before the city council for final decision. So again, this is the site location and just calling out some of those different areas. Uh, the smaller portion on the bottom left of the map uh, is where is the commercial designation and the location of the plan development amendment that amends the existing plan development that applies to the site. Uh, the larger portion here is the 280 lot uh, single family detached uh, dwelling uh, subdivision and plan development and landscape plan. Uh, the comprehensive plan map amendment and zone change apply to the entire area. Um, the parcel further north uh, on the site identified here is a parcel that's proposed to be dedicated as a public park, which I'll touch on in more detail. But just so you can see the different areas that the applications apply to. Uh, this just identifies the site again. Uh, this is from the application materials and shows kind of existing topography and existing conditions and existing parcel lines and also the floodplain delineation in that parcel proposed to be dedicated for a public park. 
Uh, the comp plan, as I mentioned, is currently uh, shown on the left on the, of the screen, um, is currently about 11.3 acres uh, of a commercial designation uh, that is proposed to be reduced to that size of this parcel identified on the right. Again, the remainder would go to residential on the comprehensive plan map. Uh, the zoning that's proposed uh, is, again, C3 on the commercial portion, so our general commercial zone. The remainder that's shown in the green on their map uh, would be the R4 multiple family residential zone. <clears throat> the existing zoning is primarily uh, EF80 land um, from the original annexation of the property and has just been uh, sitting on that property since, it's, since it was annexed into the city. Uh, there's a small portion that is R1 on the southeast portion of the site and then floodplain in the parcel that's uh, proposed to be dedicated to the north. This is the proposed development plan that's associated with the plan development and the uh, subdivision, uh, which I'll touch on in more detail as I get into the application. So I'm gonna walk through each of the six applications um, and kind of touch on the high points of each one. Obviously there's much more detail in the ordinances and in the staff report, um, but I'll hit on some of the uh, findings and um, some of the key conditions of approval that came out of the Planning Commission's recommendations for each application. Um, so the first request, again, is the comprehensive plan map amendment. Uh, the criteria for a comp plan map amendment requires to look at the goals and policies of the comprehensive plan. Uh, those are touched on in more detail in the decision document and the ordinance, but um, to summarize some of the key findings, there is identified um, in our buildable lands inventory and economic opportunities analysis uh, deficits of both commercial and residential land. Uh, so the request is to reduce the size of the commercial piece and redesignate some of it as residential. Um, the most recently acknowledged buildable lands inventory identifies a need of uh, 500 acre, over 500 acres of residential land. The 2013 economic opportunities analysis, again, the most recently acknowledged one, uh, also identifies a deficit of commercial land. So, so both are identified as a, as a deficit. Um, there is language in the comp plan review criteria that states that the housing policies shall be given added emphasis. So looking at that language um, and also ensuring that we're not excluded needed, needed housing, um, the finding uh, that's provided is that the reduced size of the commercial land does add residential land, which is needed as well, and identified as being in deficit, uh, but still provides and retains some commercial land with the 6.62 acres that are being proposed. Um, the proposed amendment uh, should be orderly and timely. Uh, it's, it's another criteria of a comp plan amendment. Uh, the applicant cites housing need again as a, as a change in the community to warrant the amendment from commercial to residential. Uh, staffs uh, included findings uh, in regards to the um, smaller area for commercial um, and that that will allow for more appropriately scaled commercial development given the surrounding residential uh, zoning and designations of both the existing uses and the um, proposed uses around the site to the north. Uh, the applicants also proposing and intending for neighborhood commercial uses and that smaller size could allow for a more suitable neighborhood commercial use development. And that's discussed more in the plan development amendment uh, request, which I'll touch on in a moment. Uh, so moving on to the zone change. Um, again, uh, consistency with the comprehensive plan goals and policies. Uh, there are goals in chapter uh, four of the economy of McMinnville to maximize efficiency of land, of commercially designated land. Uh, the proposed C3 zoning for that commercial portion uh, is consistent with the comprehensive plan map as they're proposing to amend, amend it. Um, it allows for more diverse and uh, more efficient use of the site. Uh, but just to point out again that there is an existing plan development overlay district that applies to this portion of the property. And so um, that will regulate in some ways the use and development of the site and uh, allow for that neighborhood commercial use uh, that's described by the applicant. And so planning commission is recommending that the zone change uh, to the C3 uh, not be approved unless the plan development amendment is also approved. And there's a condition of approval included uh, in the draft ordinance to reflect that. Um, there's also goals and policies in chapter five uh, related to housing and residential development, uh, providing for uh, affordable quality housing for all residents and promoting the residential development pattern that's land intensive and energy efficient. 
there are specific policies within uh, Chapter 5, uh, one of them in particular when you're looking at high-density residential, which we just touched on in our previous uh, presentation, uh, is uh, policy 71.13, which has criteria and locational requirements for high-density residential development. Uh, the site meets most of those locational requirements. Uh, it's located on an arterial street, which is Baker Creek Road, which is identified as a future transit corridor uh, and future transit plans. Uh, it's located adjacent to what would be commercial services on the proposed C3 zone portion of the site on the southwest corner of the site. Um, and it's not subject to any significant development limitations uh, as the area in the zone change is located all south of the floodplain and sloped area um, of the Baker Creek kind of riparian corridor. Uh, without more detail for the site, when we're just looking at the zone change and no other development plans, um, it's not clear that some of the other locational requirements are met. So adjacency to public or private open space, ability to buffer higher density residential from lower density residential in the surrounding area, and the capac capacity of existing services to serve development. Um, that one particular being that all the analysis that was provided was for all six concurrent applications, so it analyzed the proposed development development, not what the maximum build out could be if it was just R4 zoned land. So those issues are addressed in the subsequent applications and the plan development and the plan development amendment. So again, another reason that we're recommending that the zone change not be approved unless both the plan development and the plan development amendment are approved as well. So moving on to the plan development amendment. Again, this applies to the commercial portion on the uh, southwest portion of the site. Um, so the request is to amend an existing plan development overlay ordinance that's governed by ordinance 4633. Uh, it covers that whole existing commercial designated portion of the property that's shown in red on the uh, map on the right part of the screen. Uh, the request is to reduce the size of that plan development to be consistent with the smaller 6.62 acre commercial land. Um, they're also requesting amendments to the existing conditions of approval to allow up to 120 multiple family units and require a minimum of two acres of neighborhood commercial uses. Uh, there has been no specific development plan submitted for this portion of the site, uh, only the request to amend the existing overlay district. The existing plan development has uh, conditions of approval in it that do limit the use and the development of the site. Uh, one is that no, currently no multiple family residential is allowed on the property. Uh, and then there are some other standards that apply to development of the site and site design features, such as a uh, higher landscaping requirement than is typically required, uh, requiring development plan review by the Planning Commission, uh, limiting building height to 35 feet, and then some limits on commercial op hours of operation, lighting, signage, and storage. So those are existing conditions that apply to the property today um, and that the applicants requested to amend. And I'll touch on um, our analysis of that a little bit further. Um, so when looking at the plan development amendment review criteria, uh, the primary criteria is that there are special physical conditions or objectives of a development that warrant a departure from the current standards. Um, in this case and what's being proposed, the objectives are to introduce a mix of uses on the site by allowing the multiple family residential and then also intent in providing the neighborhood commercial uses within the site. Um, so the city must find that these objectives, um, either as they're proposed or as uh, uh, revised with conditions, warrant a departure from the standard regulation requirements, which are the existing requirements of the existing overlay district in Ordinance 4633. The Planning Commission has reviewed this um, and they are, have found and are recommending that um, those special objectives can warrant um, departure from the existing requirements of that overlay district. Um, if the development of the site's designed appropriately, given the surrounding residential use and the intent to provide the neighborhood commercial uses in this area. Um, they've also determined that the mixed uses uh, could be allowed on the site if they're integrated, which I'll touch on in a moment, and that the development of the site has to be consistent with all of our comp plan policies for commercial uh, development. 
Um, the ordinance also reflects some findings uh, to support the uh, amendment to the existing plan development overlay district in that there have been changes and conditions in the city since the plan development overlay dis district was adopted in 1996. Um, there's obviously housing inventory and affordability issues that have been identified through our previous uh, BLI and HNAs and our current draft ones, which aren't yet acknowledged, but um, are still identifying that issue. Um, there is still some consideration to preserving commercial use in this uh, Northwest area of the city that isn't there today. So um, there's some findings that the 11.3 acres may be larger than necessary for neighborhood commercial serving, uh, neighborhood serving commercial use and that type of development. And um, the city has planned for in the past at least five acres of commercial in this area. And so that's where the recommendation for that size uh, comes from in the condition of approval. Um, and again, that comes from an even earlier ordinance in the early 90s, uh, that original size of five acres. Um, in a plan development amendment, we must also look and make sure what's being proposed is consistent with our comp plan objectives and uh, policies. Um, there's a number of policies in the economy chapter related to commercial development and what that looks like. Um, so some of them are that, that commercial development maximizes efficiency of the land, um, that uh, we encourage a compact form of urban development. Uh, where urban services are available and that we um, explore utilization of innovative land use uh, ordinances that integrate the functions of housing commercial um, developments into a compatible framework in the city. Um, so findings for those policies uh, were used to draft conditions of approval. One, that the 120 multiple family dwelling units that are proposed, that those be allowed on the site um, if the multiple family units are integrated into the site uh, with neighborhood commercial uses. And we provide a description of what that integration could be through either um, being connected to each other in a mixed use building or in some other way that's identified in a development plan that's reviewed by the planning commission. Uh, we also included a condition that again limited that or required the uh, minimum commercial development to be at least five acres based on the previous planning and identification of that size in this area um, and then allowing multiple family development to occur within that if it's part of that mixed use development. Um, another policy for commercial development is, is that neighborhood commercial uses shall be allowed in um, residential areas. And the applicant did request that that be a condition of approval. Um, however, there wasn't much more detail provided than that. So a condition of approval is suggested to allow for neighborhood commercial uses and particularly in this overlay district, um, to find those as um, the uses that are permitted in section C1 of our code, which is our neighborhood business zone, um, and also add res restaurant, which is not listed. Um, just for reference, these are the permitted uses in the C1 zone that would be allowed. Um, so smaller scale kind of neighborhood serving commercial uses. Uh, the condition does state that the applicant uh, may request another use at the time that they submit their detailed development plans for review um, so that another use that's not captured here to allow for some flexibility uh, to be considered by the Planning Commission when they're reviewing the detailed development plans for the site um, and that the Planning Commission could determine whether a, a proposed use that's not captured here that might not be thought of now um, could be allowed and meets the intent of a neighborhood serving commercial use. I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify. You said restaurant is not permitted, correct? It's not listed in the C1 zone. So we did add that specifically as a um, permitted use as well. As a permitted use. So would that be any kind of restaurant? Like would that include um, like a drive through or a fast food chain uh, restaurant that could be allowed? Um, it doesn't prohibit that. Uh, we do have some other design, site design components that would not align with a drive-through in terms of uh, building orientation and uh, some of those things, which I'll touch on in a moment. Okay, and so would that similarly be true for like a drive-through coffee? Um, I think 
I think it's going to come down to the site design and what's proposed at the time of the development plans. Um, I'll touch on some of the site design conditions of approval that are included. Um, it doesn't prohibit it, but I think it would need to be integrated and still be able to meet all those other site design components, um, but it doesn't prohibit it from occurring. Okay. It would be something that would be reviewed by the Planning Commission when the detailed development plan is submitted. Okay. So, and Councilor, one of the other parameters is um, when we're looking at neighborhood serving commercial, we're looking at intensity of use. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about high intensive use, let's say fast food franchises or something like that, that are located at 99W, the transportation infrastructure is not gonna support that type of use on the corner of Baker Creek and Hill Road. So that's that's also a factor that comes into play. Um, but if you think about the Laughing Bean Bistro that's on the mm -hmm. um, intersection of Hill Road and 2nd Street, which has a drive-through, um, there is the opportunity to look at the site and just not the site design in terms of accommodating that. So, so then, go ahead. Seven, <clears throat> excuse me, so 7-Eleven probably wouldn't be appropriate either a plaid pantry. Uh, that was permitted, it said retail. Was it, I, I missed that. Food okay. retail, so. Yeah, it would allow for a food store or retail, so a smaller scale. So convenience store would probably be allowed under that. I guess I would I would um, encourage you when you're thinking about neighborhoods serving commercial. A lot of people will go to branding rather than type of use, and we can't land we can't land use describe brand names, we can land use describe how the land is used and the intensity of how that land is used. And so typically having some sort of um, food availability in what we would call a food desert, which this area is a food desert, so a place where people can go and pick up sundries if they need sundries, that is something we normally encourage in a neighborhood. Um, whether it's something that is a 7-Eleven that needs a certain traffic count to be able to um, be a viable business versus something else that though that's market conditions that will look at that yeah it's kind of the it's a, it can kind of be a double-edged sword right when you're you want to you want to invite in uh, some commercial activity that would help make a great neighborhood like oh it'd be great if you can walk down to the bakery in the morning and and get something but but but, but you can't, you can either approve or disapprove the use, right? And then what happens, happens, so. And site and design. Chuck, can I uh, ask another question while we're talking about this? Um, it talks about incorporating residential and commercial is required. Uh, what does that look like? Is it, are you talking about how, how it's integrated with regards to it being like a certain scale? Or are you talking about like, Retail on the bottom and and residential above, density residential above, or what's that? What does that mean? Yeah, so we we describe that integrated as we kind of describe some parameters on it so that they're the uses are within a comfortable walking distance or connected to each other, um, and then that the integration um, of multiple family and neighborhood shall be either in a mixed use building or a, like I said in a plan that integrates the uses between buildings in a manner that's not acceptable to the Planning Commission. So we left it as mixed use building, which would allow for retail with residential above or some other incorporation in one building to allow for some flexibility in terms of the actual built product. Um, but it could be, that, that's how we describe it as being integrated in a mixed use building. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> um, there are a number of comprehensive plan policies that are related to um, access and transportation um, and uh, discouraging auto-oriented strip development, um, limiting conflicts with adjacent land uses, uh, having the size, scale, and market of commercial uses guide their locations, um, some limitations on new direct access to arterials, and uh, minimizing conflicts with bicycle and pedestrian um, travel. And then also that uh, plan development is a way, as a method to um, um, on, on entrances to the city where you have uh, commercial use to allow for the review of site design, which is something that we're proposing. So, so we're proposing a suggested condition of approval that, uh, like I said, detailed development plans be submitted to the planning commission for review and approval uh, prior to any development occurring. 
this condition exists currently in the plan development overlay district, so um, we're keeping it there. And then we've added some subcomponents of that uh, to address a lot of the comp plan policies and some of the site design characteristics that would be more appropriate for a neighborhood commercial use. So things like that. Um, uh, include like encouraging uh, shared access points and internal circulation instead of a strip commercial with multiple access points onto the surrounding roadways, um, having parking located behind the building, uh, parking maximums, building orientation towards the right of way, so towards the street to provide that uh, more, encourage more interaction with the pedestrian environment. Um, we are suggesting that the building height be increased to 45 feet to allow for that mixed use building type. Uh, requiring pedestrian connections, uh, keeping the landscape minimum of 14% uh, for the site, um, private, providing a community gathering space, uh, and then an open space if there's any multiple family units, a minimum of 10% of the site in addition to the 14% landscaping, which um, is similar to our current requirement of 25% landscaping for multifamily, um, and then having some conditions related to signs and lighting. So some of these things are included to allow for the commercial uses to be integrated on the site and not be impactful on the surrounding residential areas. Now, would this allow for uh, mixed residential commercial or if you're talking about increasing height and possible two-story buildings? Correct, that, that's the intent of increasing the height slightly to 45 feet. The current condition limits it to 35 feet. So the condition is set up to encourage mixed use residential and commercial, ground floor commercial and residential above um, in, in terms of the requirement that five acres have ground floor commercial as part of it. Okay, thank you. Um, just to touch on a couple other things, I mentioned the access to uh, to arterials and there's a policy related to access locations not being placed that it creates excessive traffic through surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, so we've included a condition of approval that prior to any future development of the site, uh, traffic impact analysis be provided that analyzes the exact proposed use, uh, their internal circulation pattern, their access points, and the impacts of that on the surrounding street network. Um, so that was the plan development amendment that applies to the commercial portion of the site. Again, just this southwestern portion of the site. So I'll move on now to the plan development, which applies and would be a separate plan development overlay district that applies only to the single family uh, <coughs> detached dwelling portion of the site. So again, it, it would be a new plan development overlay district and it's being proposed to allow for 280 single family residential lots, uh, 18 open space tracks within the development and the dedication of a parcel for a public park. Uh, the plan development's been requested to allow for some modifications to minimum lot size, uh, reduce setbacks, lot dimensions uh, exceeding our depth to width ratios, uh, some driveway and alley width exceptions, and block length and street tree spacing standards. So the development plan includes a, a variety of different lot types, uh, which are described here in this table. Um, the SFD for single family dwelling followed by the number of 70 down to 26. Uh, the number re represents the typical lot width for that lot. Uh, so 70 being 70 feet wide, um, that being the larger type of lot down to 26 foot wide, uh, lots being the smallest. Uh, the 26 and the 30 foot lots are proposed to be alley loaded. So they would be have an alley in the rear uh, with the vehicular access coming off the back side of the property. Um, there are reduced setbacks being requested for the 70 through 40 foot lots. The minimum would uh, be a reduction to a five foot side yard setback, which would be a one foot reduction from the R4 requirement of six feet on the side yard. Uh, the 45 foot wide lots uh, is a request to go down to four feet, and then the 30 and 26 foot wide lots are request to go down to three feet. Uh, there is a proposal and it's followed up with a condition to require a larger rear yard in areas where uh, trees are proposed to be preserved. All of the other setbacks, the front, the exterior side, and the rear would follow the typical R4 standards. These are the typical uh, smaller lots in, in diagram form that's provided by the applicant. So this identifies the uh, proposed 26 foot wide and 30 foot wide lots. 
Um, again, they would front onto a street with their access, their, um, you know, their entrance being oriented towards the street. And there would be an alley in the rear that would have the vehicular access. Uh, this identifies the 45 and 40 foot lots um, with the four foot and five foot side yard setbacks. So just a diagram of what those building footprints would look like on those sized lots. Uh, the applicant also provided some um, description of the, the breakdown of the types of lots within each subdivision phase. Uh, there's 10 phases and um, some variation in the, in, the, in the type of lots that are provided in each phase. Um, the plan development review criteria are um, identical to the plan development amendment review criteria. So again, the main one that the city must uh, analyze is whether there's special, phys special physical conditions or objectives of development that warrant departure from our current um, typical standards. Uh, so the applicant provided a number of what of their um, stated special objectives, including uh, preserving trees, accommodating homes along the sloped bluff area, uh, developing around the BPA easement that runs through the site today, providing a diverse diversity of lot sizes, uh, focusing on a detached single family housing type, uh, offering on site open space, access to city parks, uh, creating a sense of place, adequate off street parking, avoiding cookie cutter housing and promoting future transit service. So these are the objectives that the applicant provided. Um, I'll kind of run through some of the components of the project that uh, seek to address those things. Uh, so in regards to tree preservation, um, a landscape plan was provided that identifies more detail on the trees that are proposed to be preserved, which are primarily along the um, sloped areas of the site and the bluff as the property slopes down to the Baker Creek uh, floodplain and riparian corridor, uh, which the development's outside of, uh, but along the area where it starts to slope. Uh, the trees are proposed to be preserved in those areas and we were including a condition of approval to require a larger rear setback to accommodate that. Um, there's also a request for tree removal within the landscape plan uh, to remove some trees, but uh, any other tree that would be removed requiring that an arborist report be provided uh, and that be provided for review by the planning director prior to any other tree larger than nine inches in diameter uh, before that tree would be removed. <laughs> Uh, natural area preservation, um, the larger lots within the subdivision are proposed along the northern boundary of the site uh, where the area starts to slope. Uh, so that preserves uh, the development on that sloped area. Uh, the applicant's also proposing to dedicate uh, that parcel to the north as a public park. Uh, that is the area of the site that includes the floodplain and the areas that are um, more in more of a natural state. Um, there is, uh, there was a geotech, a geotechnical analysis provided with the application materials that identified some additional um, work and study to be done on some portions of the site that are, are the sloped areas that could be subject to uh, soil issues. So we are including conditions of approval that, that additional geotech um, work occur prior to any development occurring. Uh, and it's in this area shown on the map on the bottom right of the screen. In regards to the mix of housing types that are provided, um, the smaller lots and the more dense developments being proposed on some of the southern portions of the site, uh, further closer to the commercial development and closer to the arterial street. And it's proposed to somewhat transition out into in density and uh, size of lot to the north as you increase the natural areas. Um, it provides more of a dense lot type near the larger street and the future transit route. Uh, it allows for those less dense and larger lots to be in the areas that are more um, uh, that transition to the natural area. Uh, so, and to require this site plan, we um, to move forward, we've inc included conditions of approval that would require this plan to be binding on the site, and also to allow the lot size averaging that they are proposing. Um, I mentioned before that the smaller lots are proposed to be alley loaded. So you can see that there's an alley provided in the rear for the vehicles and then the uh, front of the homes would front onto open space tracks in some cases and then onto the street in some other cases. Um, this reduces vehicular conflicts with those narrower lots. Uh, if you had driveways on the front, there would be a lot of vehicle traffic crossing the sidewalk. Uh, it lessens the garage door dominance on the front facade on a smaller building product. Um, and it also allows for that frontage onto an open space, which in some areas will promote, promote some more um, kind of social 
cohesion of the neighborhood. Um, we are suggesting some conditions of approval that apply to the plan development just to um, memorialize that and require that any lot that's less than 40 feet wide be alley loaded and also that the alleys be private. Uh, they were proposed as being public alleys, but because they're only providing access to just those lots, we're suggesting that they be private so they're maintained by the HOA and the lots that take access from them. Um, open space amenities are being proposed throughout the plan development. There's 18 open space tracks proposed in total. Um, staff and the Planning Commission are uh, proposing that the city accept five of the tracks, uh, which are would allow for the extension of the BPA trail that exists uh, currently south of Baker Creek Road today. Um, all of the other tracks would be private and would be maintained by the HOA. Uh, so we've included conditions of approval that again memorialize that and state which tracks would be accepted by the city and which ones uh, would be under the HOA. Uh, the applicant is proposing a specific city park dedication and improvements associated with that and those conditions of approval that I just mentioned would um, specify the improvements to occur in that. And these are supported by our parks master plan uh, which identifies um, a special use park, acquiring a special use park adjacent to the BPA easement which is identified here on the parks master plan map. Um, green space and a greenway, a cry and a greenway along Baker Creek connecting Tice and the BPA easement. Uh, if you remember the Oak Ridge Meadows subdivision to the east had that component as well. Uh, so this project is proposing to make that connection in their portion of the site to the Oak Ridge Meadows uh, trail to allow that to continue further east. Uh, develop the west side trail, which is the BPA trail as it's more commonly referred to. Uh, it's identified here on the parks plan and then develop a trail in the Baker Creek Greenway. Um, again, that trail all around the floodplain and the special use park uh, would achieve that. Um, the extension of the BPA easement would continue north from where the um, the current BPA trail terminates at Baker Creek Road and it would align with that on the north side and it would continue north through tracks. These are the tracks that would be accepted by the city um, immediately. Uh, continue north and then terminate uh, at the northern portion of the site within the parcel that's proposed to be dedicated as a public park. Um, a greenway trail would then connect from that area to uh, around the floodplain, which is a seasonal pond at some time, some people refer to it as a pond, um, and connect to the Oak Ridge Meadows Trail uh, that's around the northern boundary of that subdivision. Um, so we're including a condition of approval again to specify the, the improvements that would occur there and those require that the trail be improved to the same standard as exists south of Baker Creek Road. Uh, we're also suggesting that an enhanced uh, pedestrian crossing be provided at the one area where the trail is going to cross the street. Uh, so, and we require that to be similar to the enhanced crossings with the signs and the striping in the street that exists south of Baker Creek Road. Um, and then we also have a condition to provide one more pedestrian access point to the BPA trail or to the Greenway trail. Uh, because the northwest portion of the site uh, didn't have as much pedestrian access to the site as the other portions which have uh, some proposed access points. So uh, allowing for some flexibility in that but requiring that it be provided uh, between this portion of uh, Herald Street, I believe it is, off the top of my head, to the uh, Greenway Trail or the BPA Trail. Again, I mentioned the city park dedication would be that parcel uh, to the north. Um, we, through a condition of approval, would memorialize that and require the dedication of that park parcel and also an easement uh, because the parcels don't completely align to allow for the connection to the Oak Ridge Meadows Trail. Um, and then also require improvement of a trailhead terminus and the Greenway Trail that I mentioned, which are identified here in a little more detail on the preliminary plans. Um, some of the private recreational amenities, so the other 13 tracks that are proposed would all be private. Um, improvements have been proposed for those, including some play equipment, landscaping, uh, seating areas, uh, things of that nature, and our conditions of approval require that those improvements that they propose be uh, constructed at the time of the subdivision, uh, subdivisions are platted. 
Um, another intent of the applicant was to provide adequate off-street parking for the subdivision and the planned development area. Uh, so they requested wider driveways than that are currently allowed by our code. Um, we have included a condition, this was discussed with Planning Commission, uh, to allow for those wider driveways on the private lots themselves, but that the driveway width uh, narrow down to what our code requires, which is 40% of the lot frontage. Um, the intent behind that was to reduce, again, um, vehicle conflicts in the sidewalk space and to provide more space for street trees and utilities, which are also um, somewhat tight in the overall development because of the denser development pattern. Um, we did allow for an exception for the 40 foot wide lots to allow those to have a 20 foot wide driveway uh, because the, the difference between the code and the 20 feet was not substantial and still allows for a two, typical two car um, driveway and garage. Um, another intent uh, behind the applicant's proposal was to avoid cookie cutter housing. Um, and uh, because the lot size and the dimensions that are being proposed uh, will result in a denser development pattern than is typical of our code, um, the Planning Commission's re recommending that there be specific design standards that apply to uh, the development of the single family homes, and that those be reviewed at the time of building permits um, for, the, for each individual property. Um, so the design standards relate to a number of things, style and massing, quality and type of exterior materials, uh, front porches, roof design, exterior doors and windows, garage door types, uh, lighting and colors. And um, these same areas of design consideration were included as a condition on the Baker Creek developments south of Baker Creek Road, but there were some additional standards and more detailed standards applied in this, uh, in the Baker Creek North recommended condition of approval uh, to more, um, to address these things in more detail. Uh, so it's more of an assurity of what the final design would look like. Just to touch on some other design features that are proposed um, and required through the conditions of approval, uh, the applicant's proposing a, a wider meandering sidewalk along Baker Creek Road. Uh, so a condition of approval to require that. Um, allow for longer block lengths and block perimeter lengths than are required by the code. And that's being allowed because there's these mid-block pedestrian crossings being provided through the parks and uh, some other sidewalk and trail connections. Um, so, those are, so those are all the major kind of design components of the site. Um, some of the other plan development review cr criteria require um, us to look at the streets, anticipated traffic and utility and drainage and making sure that all those things are adequate for what's being proposed. Um, the applicant has addressed uh, the utility and the drainage issues and there's no concerns from um, the appropriate agencies with those being provided to serve the site. Um, and they also provided a traffic impact analysis that analyzed the street uh, operations at the surrounding intersections at Meadows, Shadden, and Michael Book. Um, and the uh, resulting traffic from the development would not exceed our current volume to capacity uh, um, ratio maximum that's in our code um, at any of the intersections, um, except for Michael Book and Baker Creek Road. Um, which the applicant pointed out is identified in our transportation system plan for a, a larger improvement with the traffic signal in the future. Uh, so following on the plan development was a tentative subdivision application. Uh, this would allow for that 280 lot single family development. Uh, and it's proposed to be in 10 phases. Uh, it's subject to the, the land division standards in our code and then also the requirements of the PE uh, that was previously discussed. So um, it aligns with that plan development, development plan, but just to touch on some of the other components of the design. Excuse me, before you go on to yeah. the next section, I just don't want to lose this point. Um, on the traffic analysis the slide that you just came off of, that mm -hmm. one, yeah. Um, why is the uh, the traffic at 99W and Baker Creek not part of the traffic plan that they have to cons that we consider with these subdivisions? Um, that intersection wasn't identified as one to be included in this traffic impact analysis. Um, these were the surrounding intersections that were included. Uh, the Michael Book Lane is further than most other traffic impact analysis that we require 
um, and so was already a further intersection than we typically require, uh, but we did include that as the next you know, kind of larger intersection of an arterial and a larger collector street. But, but I just want to make sure I understood. So you said that at Michael Book, there's a, an identified need for enhanced traffic by adding a light there at Michael Book and Baker Creek. Mm -hmm. um, I'll ask, I don't know if it's appropriate in this point, but what, can you tell me what the impact might be on Baker Creek and, and 99W because I've been getting a lot of complaints from residents about increased traffic with these new subdivisions at that intersection. Um, I don't know, if Mike, do you want to touch on that at all? So we've had this discussion at um, <clears throat> several different points in time uh, regarding uh, capacity of intersections as the city continues to grow. When we adopted our transportation system plan in 2010 and evaluated how our system would be served at full build out, we agreed as a community that congestion will continue to increase at our major intersections. We don't have the ability to build our way out of traffic. Um, there aren't good corridors east west given geography, uh, creek corridors, things like that. Um, and uh, so we look for a suite of things uh, to deal with uh, traffic as we grow. We look to improve the bicycle and pedestrian network to provide those alternate modes of transportation. We look to uh, our partnership with the county to have more robust uh, transit uh, system. And then we look for the ability to add capacity within the existing network, particularly at um, major intersections. ODOT is currently working on a project to add capacity at most major signalized intersections along the Highway 99 corridor. That's part of a roadway safety project that they've received funding for. And so at a number of our key intersections along 99 within the next year or so, you'll see left turn phasing added on the side streets. And that's the major challenge we're having right now is uh, particularly at the intersection you mentioned, there isn't left turn phasing. So those folks wanting to turn left at those intersections off our streets onto the highway are competing with the through traffic that's coming at them. So as ODOT finishes those projects to add left turn phasing, which uh, frankly is gonna add congestion on the main line because it's taking time off of Highway 99 and giving it to the side streets. Um, it will improve traffic flow, but overall we'll see, as we continue to grow, we'll continue to see increased congestion at our major intersections. And so our standards that are in the transportation system plan have a volume capacity ratio in them for major intersections. Um, and the traffic study that was uh, performed for this uh, particular development showed that those intersections will still meet our standard with the exception of Michael Book, which in our plan does call to be signalized in the future. So. And, and Councilor, if I can follow up a little bit on your question of why, what intersections are chosen for the study. Uh, when a new development comes online, we're really looking at the impact of that new development uh, on immediate intersections because those intersections haven't been fully built yet and we wanna understand what that means. In terms of the system as a whole, so the, uh, the traffic being carried down to Baker and 99W, the transportation system plan has already identified that this particular street can carry these many cars and this is how it's gonna operate when it hits this other street. So that's, that's a system in impact that we've already planned for, but we want to understand what are the immediate public improvements needed for the intersections that this development, adjacent to this development, in case there's any public improvements we need to do there that we haven't, that haven't already been built out. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Adam. Uh, piggyback on Sal, since we're talking traffic, um, how come no Hill Road intersections are listed on this? I mean, do we figure every car leaving that subdivision is gonna go out Baker Creek? No, again, so the, the, Hill, the Hill Road is part of the overall infrastructure system. Um, the roundabout itself has already been designed to accommodate the, tr the build out for this, de for this development. So when we put the transportation system plan together and the sort of larger pieces of it, um, we do it based on build out of occurring within the city's UGB. So we're already assuming that the, these parcels are gonna build out to a certain level of density 
and create a certain amount of trips and can the overall backbone of the system accommodate that then as we as the smaller local streets start coming on to the to the system we want to understand what is those intersections look like as the trips come off the development onto the onto the larger roads so hill road's a larger road it's already been accommodated in terms of the trips um, hitting it and the expectation is there will be disbursement so people will go down Baker Creek or Hill based on where they want to go in the community. Hello, thank you. Uh, I have a follow-up question to that explanation. The um, You said you, you make overall estimates for some of those major infrastructure pieces based on your assumed build out of those big pieces. This proposal is asking us to build at a higher density than was assumed. Are we assuming that it's still at the same rate or that those rates would change? Does that question make sense? Yeah, I can touch on that. Um, so the, the overall density that's being proposed is not substantially higher than what was assumed under the R1 zone. Um, the TIA that was provided specifically analyzed, analyzed what they're proposing to build out. So it analyzed 280 single family dwelling units and also um, a maximum kind of worst case scenario build out on the commercial piece of 100,000 square feet of retail space, which is much more than is likely to be developed there. Um, we do also have a requirement that the TIA be updated once the commercial development plans solidified, like I talked about. Um, so the TIA did analyze what they are currently proposing. At, at uh, these intersections? Correct, for the our surround, immediate surrounding area. Not the other ones that we've just been talking about that were based on less dense. They actual. were. Um, I'd have to compare the density that's being proposed, but um, because it is single family detached, it is an R4 zone, which would allow for multiple family at a much higher density. Mm -hmm. um, the actual density being proposed is not significantly higher than um, the R1 zone. I'm gonna have to verify in this in the materials the exact number, but. Um, so just quickly, I'll run through some components of the subdivision plan. So again, the subdivision plan is submitted and it's consistent with the plan development plan that, um, that we just reviewed. Um, the street network within the plan, you probably already noticed, but it was a design to align with the surrounding existing streets and align with those intersections at um, Shadden uh, to the south and north, which was something that was discussed with the Oak Ridge Meadows application, uh, Blake Street, uh, Meadows and Hill Road and an extension to the north that they're calling Hill Lane. Um, the uh, lots that are being proposed, again, they're consistent with the plan development. Uh, street access is being provided uh, as required by the code, except for those alleys, which were allowed by the plan development as well. Um, they are proposing the subdivision and the plan development build out in 10 phases, which are identified here on the screen. Um, so we've included a condition to approve that phasing plan um, and then some time frames on the approval, which is typical of our subdivision. So we are including a condition that the first phase expire within two years, in two years from the date of the approval, and that each subsequent phase expire five years from the date of approval. Um, it allows for the applicant's proposed tentative time frame that they suggested, uh, which is listed on the screen over uh, the coming years. They do describe in their materials that um, the phase, phases may not happen 1A through 1D and then 2A through 2C. Things could happen uh, concurrently, and it's really driven by utility provision within each subdivision phase as the utility system is built out. Um, there is a condition, a policy related to lot sales and that the applicant provide um, a certain number of their lots to uh, for sale. So we've included a condition that would require that 25% um, of um, the single family lots within each phase be offered for sale for a certain amount of time to allow for a, a, the intent behind that, um, allow for a variety of uh, building form in the, in the community. Uh, just some other conditions of approval to note. Um, one, it requires a redesign of one of the intersections. Uh, the geometry was not identified as being ideal or uh, meeting our code, so it provided a more safe intersection that that one be redesigned, which could result in some changes to the lot configuration in that little area. Um, and then again, requiring that the alleys be private 
in either a tract or an easement within the subdivision phases. Um, and then we also included a number of other conditions that are kind of more typical of our subdivision. Um, so requiring uh, CCNRs and a homeowner association. Um, uh, one thing to note with that is that the HOA would maintain the open space tracks, the private ones, and then also the public parcel um, until the year 2032, at which point the maintenance of that larger parcel would transfer to the city uh, to allow for the time for the city to plan for uh, maintenance of that. Um, some right-of-way dedication uh, standards for right-of-way improvements and process for review, and then a require for any applicable um, other agency permits as well. Chuck, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So we're requiring the alleys be private. Would that mean the HOA would also be responsible for those alleys? Right? Co correct. Yeah. Um, finally, uh, the landscape plan review. Um, so the landscape plan included a request for tree removals, uh, specifically 17 trees uh, identified on the site. It includes a street tree plan for all of the streets and the planter strip on all the new uh, local streets within the plan development area and the subdivision. And then landscaping in the open space, space tracks, both the ones that would be private and the ones that would be dedicated as public parks. Um, just to highlight some of the conditions of approval, um, those uh, verify the approved tree species that are proposed, allow for some variations in the spacing of street trees, uh, some additional locations where trees could be provided, um, and then also responding some, to some comments from McMinnville Water and Light uh, requiring some amendments to tree species near the electrical transmission lines um, and some setbacks from their utilities. Um, and then for those reasons, uh, requiring the middle of a revised landscape plan that addresses those items. Um, you may have noted one of the tracks wasn't really identified for improvement, and that is, it was tracked to G, which is going to be a pump station to serve sewer uh, capacity for the subdivisions. Um, so we are, have included a condition that that be a landscape plan be provided for that tract as well. Um, that one will be one of the ones that's accepted by the city as it's a pump station. Um, and the condition specifies a minimum percent and then some screening of the pump station from surrounding residential lots. Um, so in terms of the hearing process to date, a uh, neighborhood meeting was provided by the applicant um, prior to submitting their land use application. There was 10 attendees that signed in on the sign-in sheet. Uh, the public hearing was held by the Planning Commission on December 5th. Uh, we had two items of written public testimony that are included in your, in your packet of materials, and um, three people testified in opposition at the public hearing before the Planning Commission. Um, the opposition testimony related to uh, the reduction of the commercial land, uh, traffic on Baker Creek Road, design of the building product that would occur, um, some of the housing mix, and some of the mass and scale of the project. Uh, the applicant also provided testimony as well, uh, described their application, and then they did express some concerns with some of the architectural standards and the driveway limitations as well. Um, and the minutes from the Planning Commission are included in your in your packet as well. Um, you may have noted that some of the testimony that was provided uh, mentioned some of the previous land use actions and some of the limitations that currently apply to the site, particularly the multifamily piece in the commercial area. We just want to provide some background for you so you're aware of the process that's occurred to date over the number of years. Um, so I mentioned before that the five acres of commercial area was originally designated in 1991 uh, by Ordinance 4506. Um, that was as a part of a, a larger designation of commercial land all over the city, and this was one of those sites. Um, once development was starting to be proposed for the area um, in the mid-90s, 1996, um, the applicant at that point in time and the developer came in and with a development plan, um, and that resulted in multiple family being on the southeast corner of Hill Road and Baker Creek Road. That's the multifamily site that's being built out right now. Um, that review of that resulted in a condition of approval that they come in with an application to designate land on the north side of Baker Creek Road for commercial. Um, so that happened at a later date as a separate land use application in Ordinance 4633. That's the one we're talking about again tonight and talking about amending. That resulted in designating 12.34 acres, which increased and also included a condition that limited the multifamily. So this is the area that was being discussed at that point in time in, in 1996. Uh, Baker Creek Road's running 
top to bottom here, hill roads here. Um, so ordinance 4626 dealt with this area. That's what came in and designated multiple family in the southern area. Um, it resulted in a condition of approval that a commercial area to the north be designated, and that's what created 4633. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the plan at that point in time, which didn't obviously fully materialize. Uh, more recently, Ordinance 5021 was approved in 2017. This approved the plan development amendment on the south that allows for the current Baker Creek West and Baker Creek East developments that are building out right now. Um, that ordinance repealed 4626, so that's no longer in effect, uh, which was one of the original PD amendments in that area. Um, and then even more recently, Ordinance 5076 reduced the size of the 4633 PD, and that was to allow for the um, Mac Water and Light substation expansion. Um, so the remaining PD overlay district is everything that we're dealing with tonight with that 11.3 acres. Um, this was also discussed at the Planning Commission just as kind of a reference. Um, there has been a lot of planning in this area for higher density and commercial uses um, around this node of the city. Uh, this is some work that was done during the previous um, growth management uh, discussions and planning uh, in the early 2000s. So never adopted, but it just is showing kind of a reference that this area has been identified for higher density and mixed uses in this area of the city. And if I, can you go back to that for a minute? So um, just to answer your question, Councillor Geary, be, that you had before, the transportation system plan was built based off, off the premise of what was in the McMinnville Growth and Management Urban Plan, um, which is this neighborhood activity center. So there is high density residential that was plugged into the model for the overall system. What prevented that from being adopted? Ah, that's the <laughs> million dollar question. That's the urban growth boundary amendment. So it's actually a great planning product and uh, did not move forward because the urban growth boundary amendment did not move forward. And we'll be talking about that next week. Oh, I hear you. <laughs> um, so thank you for listening through the six applications. Um, I realized there was a lot of information there, um, but it is six applications that we had to go through. So um, the Planning Commission uh, is recommending approval of the um, six applications, most of them with conditions, some of them uh, condition that they don't take effect unless other ones um, are approved as well, which I kind of touched on through my presentation. Um, so council options are tonight to complete a first and second reading of the ordinances uh, as recommended by Planning Commission. Uh, the council may also call for a public hearing on the applications. Uh, if that was the uh, what the council preferred, that would be held on January 28th, uh, two weeks from tonight. Um, per direction that was provided by the council during department head comments at a previous meeting, we did notice that hearing in case the public hearing wanted to be held so that we could meet the required notification time frame. Um, we are working underneath that 120 day time frame, so it has been noticed and would allow for that should the council want to have the public hearing. With that, I'd welcome any additional questions you might have. Thank you, Chuck. Um, we've had a lot of material for a m number of weeks, but any specific questions that you didn't have the opportunity to ask during Chuck's presentation? Go ahead, Sal. Thanks, Mayor. Um, uh, Chuck, I just had one question that is not directly germane to the application, but it's more of a general, more of a general question. Uh, so this project necessitates several zone changes, um, which means that the um, that which changes the conditions that the property was purchased under. My question is that when we've looked at previous housing development applications and we've seen concerns raised about things like the floodplain maybe not um, being accurate today or maybe that map needing to be updated, but because the floodplain was set at the time that the property was um, zoned, uh, I might be using the language there wrong, but, but basically you get the idea that because the floodplain was determined at the time that the property was purchased, uh, we're not able to update that floodplain in a way that affects future development. My question is, when we do these kinds of zone changes, is that an opportunity to update the floodplain map as a condition of changing the zone? Um, 
Heather might be able to touch on that. I'll, I'll say, I mean, the, the floodplain area is identified in our zone consistently with the FEMA firm panel, the flood insurance rate map panels. So the floodplain area that's shown there is currently what's regulated by FEMA as the 100-year floodplain. Um, all of our code language follows that ling language as well, so it refers to um, the 100-year floodplain as identified by FEMA. So we are working under our standards, which call for using that as the as the area that's uh, identified for the floodplain and the standards that then apply in that floodplain. Um, as for whether we have the opportunity to change that now. Well, at this point in time, no. So the, the both the development code and the comprehensive plan um, outline that the floodplain zone is specific to these adopted maps, date specific, that's written into those two foundational documents. If we want to be able to change that, then what we would need to do is change the policy language to be able to then apply it differently. But even if we were to change the policy language, that would not retroactively change the bundle of rights that attaches to that, unless there's some trigger, isn't that right? Yep. Okay. Uh, yep. Other questions? Uh, back to the commercial acreage and different ordinances we've had, uh, just to clarify some things on that. So when we voted in 2017 on Baker Creek East-West, mm -hmm. they were they were allowed less commercial property in that, that those two subdivisions because they allocated some of that land on the north side and now they're wanting to take away some of that commercial land on the north side? Um, no, not exactly. Um, so the commercial designation that exists today was created in uh, 1996 by ordinance 4633, which was a result of a condition of approval from ordinance 4626. So um, what came in for development under ordinance 5021, which is the Baker Creek West and Baker Creek East, was working under all the previous approvals uh, from that. So they didn't change anything in that more recent development proposal. Um, the area to the north still existed. That's what we're dealing with here tonight. And so they are now requesting that it be reduced um, to the 6.62 acres. Um, the, the action in 2017 didn't specifically reduce or change any commercial area. It was working under the previous review and approvals. If that makes sense. Uh, it, yeah, I just remember in 17 that we talked about that commercial corner extensively. And yeah, it was referenced as, um, I think in the findings for the, as multiple families included in the Baker Creek West area on this portion of the site. Um, I think it was referenced in the findings that there was other commercial des designated land to the north that would provide that locational requirement for higher density residential. Um, so I think that's what it was in reference to. And how many acres was it referencing at that point? Um, it was referencing what was there today. So today that's 11.3 acres, um, which they're requesting to reduce to 6.62. But the, the locational analysis for, so in 2017, when there was a lot of discussion about the commercially zoned land, uh, a significant amount of discussion was designing development standards for the multifamily units that would be built on that land. And folks, most of our conditions are relative to that so that we could um, mitigate impact to the single family residential neighborhoods around it. Um, and then the locational analysis that Chuck's referencing is when we locate multifamily residential product in McMinnville, we need to ensure that it's near transit, it's near parks, and it's near commercial services. And so the finding for that multifamily product south of Baker Creek was that it will be near commercial services because there's a comp plan designation for commercial services on the north side. It's not specific to size um, that we need to have this much commercial service in in proximity to multifamily. It's just that, that it, it does exist. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, um, we uh, have the opportunity to schedule a public hearing on these ordinances or to have a first reading on the ordinances. What would be your pleasure this evening? 
I'd personally like a public hearing. Okay. I got that. Do we have a, so uh, I'll just do a, a fast vote uh, from that perspective. It's been moved that we have a public hearing. Do I have a second? Yes, second. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay. Uh, so we have a majority that we would uh, move to a public hearing. Um, so the city council would like to move forward and schedule a public hearing for ordinances 50, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, and 89. We will schedule that hearing for January 28, 2020 at our regularly scheduled uh, city council meeting. Um, and so we've, uh, uh, we've uh, uh, again, uh, that first vote was just to move to that. And so uh, uh, I'll, I'll move that those um, ordinances, uh, 84 through 89, uh, be moved to a public hearing. Again, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed with a an nay? And so it's a vote. Uh, a six to zero that we will move to a public hearing to consider these proposed ordinances on Tuesday, January 28th, uh, 2020. Uh, that concludes our city council meeting this evening. Thank you for those in attendance and uh, the public hearing will be held on the 28th. Thank you.